All righty. Hello, everybody. Welcome to our Wednesday at NICO winter webinar series. Um, we're very, very thrilled to have Susanna Monrubia today um, as our guest speaker. We're very excited for your presentation. Um, but just a few a quick announcements before we get started. Um, if you're new to this webinar series and you should have a question for our speaker, please, please feel free to use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen and ask your question. Um, we'll be monitoring the Q&A during the talk and there will also be time after the presentation for questions. Um, so please, we love getting questions from our participants um, and don't be afraid to ask questions. It's great to have them. Um, our next announcement is we have a few new um, additions to our NICO core faculty. Um, the first is Catherine Amato. She's an assistant professor um, in the Department of Anthropology at Northwestern. We have Hao Ki Zhang, who is an associate professor at McCormick. Um, and then Adam Pa, um, most people know, was our associate director for NICO. He is staying on the core faculty. Um, so we, we thank them for joining us and we're very excited to have them um, as additions to our Nico family. Um, so now I'm going to turn things over to Luis Amaral. Um, Luis is one of our co-directors here at Nico, a very prominent face in our community. Um, and he's also a professor um, in the McCormick Department of Engineering. So Luis, thank you so much for joining us today. And I'm going to turn things over to you. Hi, everybody. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce Professor Susanna Manrubia to you. Um, uh, Professor Manrubia studied physics at the University of Barcelona. And those of you that know me know that I always like to tell a, a little story. And in this case, the story is more about me that, and Spain than about um, uh, Susanna, it, it's, I, I studied in Portugal and when I went to the US to, um, to get my PhD, came to the US to get my PhD, I met a bunch of uh, Spanish physicists and I was really, really jealous because all the Spanish physicists seemed to know one another and they had this amazing community. And I had gotten my master's in Portugal and I didn't know any physicist that was outside of my department. So it was really, really depressing. And I was so jealous of the amazing community that they had and still have. And, and, and the community, especially, I'm familiar with the statistical physics community in, in Spain, and, and they are an extraordinary group of people, both individually as, as, as scientists. So uh, Susanna is one of the uh, best representatives of, of that community. She does really uh, outstanding research. Um, she like many of those physicists actually went abroad to uh, expand their network. So she was an Humboldt fellow of the Max Planck Society in Germany and a postdoctoral researcher at the Max Planck Institute of Colloids and Interfaces. Uh, she's currently in the Department of Molecular Biology and Biotechnology at the National Center for Biotechnology in Madrid. Her work is primarily theoretical and computational, but she maintains close collaboration with various experimental groups. Our interests, uh, and this is really exciting to me and to people at NICO, really spans a broad range of, of subjects, for, uh, especially in biological phenomena, all the way from genome to um, uh, dynamics to large scale evolution, as well as the emergence of cultural patterns and collective social behavior. And I was just looking to things, to, through things and I realized that she recently published a paper in PNAS that I haven't read, but looks really interesting uh, on the predictability limits of, of an expanding epidemic. So she has done really, really fascinating work on many fascinating problems. And we are all very lucky to be able to, to learn uh, more about her research. Um, and if you are not familiar with it, you are in for a treat. So uh, please uh, helping me in welcoming Susanna to the NICO seminar. Thank you very much. 
Luis, that was an amazing uh, introduction. So I feel overwhelmed by your words and by your anecdote about the Spanish community. It's true. I mean, uh, uh, we are somehow linked one to another. There are a few generations of physicists that uh, we all somehow stepped into complex systems and there we are. Okay, so thank you for the invitation. Thank you for all of you who are on the other side of this screen. Um, it's nice also that somehow this pandemic allows us to share a research without jet lag. Yeah, so I'm sitting here at home. I will close my screen and go have dinner with my family. Okay, so it has pros and cons, right? So this is my topic today. Uh, this is something that we've been working in for uh, over a decade. This is about the evolutionary consequences of genotype spaces architecture. Um, some theoretical results, which uh, we have devoted most of our efforts to this uh, investigation, and then some empirical observations that are more recent in time. And uh, so I will present some unpublished results regarding these uh, empirical observations. Okay, so um, as, as you know, uh, the map from genotype to phenotype is an exceedingly complex problem. So we have uh, genomes and genomes eventually uh, through a series of uh, expression layers and in a given environment and under certain conditions and uh, after a developmental program and so on, give rise to an organism, right? So this problem cannot be studied uh, for the time being exhaustively. Uh, in, in its whole complexity. So what we usually do is to reduce the complexity of this problem to some simplified versions of this mapping from genotype to phenotype, for instance. Uh, what we uh, often do is uh, we use sequences, we have the sequences and we can map those sequences, in this case an RNA sequence, to a secondary RNA structure. And this ca we can use as a proxy for the phenotype of this um, sequence, right? Same can be uh, applied to proteins. You have the sequence of your protein and then you have a three-dimensional structure, which is not the function of the protein, but that conditions strongly the function that eventually this protein will have. This kind of problems we can tackle. Um, there are some uh, so, so computational approaches and also some theoretical approaches that I will uh, cover briefly today. And this is what we can do, right? So we cannot uh, go to the full problem, but uh, can find some insights on how this works uh, with these simplified uh, versions. Okay, so one important feature of this genotype to phenotype map is the, is the existence of very high redundancy. What does this mean? This means that you have a sequence, but you can have, for instance, sorry, some synonymous mutations that do not affect the, um, of course, the structure that you get for your molecule, they are hidden somehow in this structure, but they can be many. So many different mutations, uh, meaning that there are many different sequences can map onto the same uh, uh, molecule. You can also irrelevant structural changes somehow, uh, a, 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 a mutation that is not synonymous, that affects somehow the structure, but that uh, this uh, does not affect function. But you can also go to higher levels. You can have even gene knockouts and in certain uh, environments even. So losing a gene doesn't mean the organism is not viable. What we know is that the larger the number of levels, the higher the redundancy that you have in your systems. And this allows you to, um, so this is the generation that is there, allows you to navigate the space of function. This is uh, an old idea, somehow old idea that was first put forward by uh, John Maynard Smith in the 70s. And he took this example of the four letter words in English, right? So uh, there are many uh, sequences of four letters that have meaning, work, word, war, and many others that do not have meaning. But somehow you can uh, navigate the space of meaning by applying just point mutations to these four letter sequences, right? So this was, this was the metaphor that he was using to, to, to mean that somehow if you are going to navigate the space of sequences for uh, functional proteins, you have to uh, have an underlying structure that is a sort of network that allows you to introduce this point mutation and you are not losing the functionality of the, of the protein you are mutating, 
right? So this was his uh, wrapping up of this uh, mechanism, saying if evolution by natural selection is to occur, functional proteins must form a continuous network which can be traversed by unit mutational steps without passing through non-functional intermediates. That's an extremely powerful idea, first uh, so formulated in this context, um, while in a broader conceptual uh, context also where it, it, it seemed problematic to reach function from something that was half functional or not functional at all. But this has uh, shown that this is a, a possible solution. So what is the architecture of these networks? This is something that we and, and other groups in the community have been concerned with uh, for, for um, almost 20 years by now. And uh, a, a model that we have used uh, and was uh, introduced at first by the Vienna group where Peter Schuster and some other brilliant people uh, were working is uh, the, the case of the RNA secondary structure. So as I was introducing previously, you have a sequence and just based on thermodynamical principles, you can assign to each of RNA sequence a secondary structure which corresponds to the minimum free energy structure. Right. This is form so uh, nucleotides tend to form pairs of different energies, and then you reach this configuration. And this can be used as a proxy for the phenotype. Admittedly simple, but even this simplicity is exceedingly complex in its, in a sense that you will see now. So there is there are lots of redundancy in this mapping. This is an example of uh, five different uh, sequences. They are as far as two random sequences might be, sharing only about 25% of their positions. And they all map to the same secondary structure, which is this one shown here. These are short sequences, just length 35, right? So uh, functional molecules uh, can be pretty much larger. And what we do to construct networks um, in the Maynard-Smith sense is to uh, assign a node to each of the sequences and put a link between two nodes if they are a distance one mutation, right? This is just a definition. You can construct a, a network. If you could explore all possible sequences of a given length, you could partition your space into a set of networks that map into also an ensemble of different secondary structures. What is the size of these spaces of these networks? Can we have an idea of uh, what are we talking about? So, one can calculate an upper bound to the number of different secondary structures for sequences of length n, right? And of course, you have four to the n different sequences. Just for length 35, as in this example, you have about 10 to the 10 different secondary structures. These are large numbers. But on the average, every of the secondary structures has 10 to the 11 approximately different sequences that map into each structure. And this is just for length 35. This is a space that we cannot explore exhaustively. Can you imagine what happens when you have sequences that are closer to the, to the length of, of real functional molecules, like length 100, for instance? Well, the number of, of, of possible sequences of possible secondary structure is well over the size of particles in the universe. So this means that uh, from a computational viewpoint, we will never ever be able of systematically exploring those spaces. So um, what we have been doing through the years is try to explore smaller spaces and try to extrapolate to larger sizes and see if we can do some theory. So the problem is not simple, but only if we can extract uh, some principles, some um, yeah, trends that do not depend on size, can we possibly say something about the asymptotic structure of such spaces. This is an example with sequences of length 20 only. This is, uh, this is a space we can exhaustively fold and calculate all the networks. And for instance, in the upper plot, what you see are the uh, different uh, degree distributions. So the number of neighbors, of neutral neighbors of each uh, sequence in your network for different network sizes. So these all belong to sequences of length 20, right? So there is a broad range of different sizes, each corresponding to one different phenotype, one different secondary structure. 
So you see that there is this uh, distribution that uh, increases in the average degree and becomes broader as the size of the network increases. And we do not have yet a good um, idea of what might be the functional shape of this degree distribution. This is what we have, just uh, some empirical examples. But we do have a good uh, knowledge of how the average degree of these networks changes. And this is something that we can calculate analytically for RNA with some assumptions that are quite reasonable and tells us that the average degree of, of a network with N genotypes, right? This average degree goes like the logarithm. It's proportional to the logarithm of the number of genotypes times a factor that depends on the specific uh, phenotype secondary structure that I'm uh, working with. So that's nice because this is a, a, a result that holds for any size of the network. So we can extrapolate to longer sequences. And remarkably, and this is uh, also a, an important point that we are also exploring and uh, that uh, makes this problem absolutely amazing is that for all the genotype to phenotype maps that have been explored, this relationship holds. So the average degree of the networks is proportional to the logarithm of the size of the network. This tells us that maybe there are some universal features of these networks and perhaps we can go to an evolutionary theory that considers these universal properties as something that is not particular of a model, but that is a, a, an actual property of genotype spaces. Another property of these networks is that they are assortative, and this is related uh, to, to the existence of genetic correlations. Assortativity means that if I have a node a sequence that, have, that has a few uh, neighbors, also the neighbors have few neighbors. And the other way around, if I have a highly connected sequence, then also the neighbors of this sequence tend to be highly connected. Right? So I have this increasing dependency between the degree of a node and the average degree of the neighbors of a node. Another quantity that we could calculate and that we believe also might be a universal property of, of uh, genotype to phenotype maps is the distribution of phenotype sizes. This is, um, I repeat, if you, in the case of RNA, for instance, you take a secondary structure, all the ensemble of secondary structures, and you make the distributions of how many genotypes map onto each secondary structure, you calculate the distribution, and you get a log normal distribution. This is a comparison between theory, this log normal continuous line, and uh, data. Right? This is computational data. This is the folding of the space of sequences of length 20, an exhaustive uh, fold. And uh, as you can see, it fits nicely, even if uh, there could be strong finite size effects still for length 20, it fits nicely the theory. Um, when you go to longer sequences, for instance, uh, length 100, this is an interesting relationship. This is now comparing the, the, the theoretical distribution, again, a log normal, with uh, observations based on actual functional sequences of non-coding RNA, okay? So you go to the RNA database, you take all your sequences of length 100, you look at the secondary structures and you calculate, and this is another problem that has been solved, you can estimate the size of the associated neutral network to each of those sequences. And what you see is that for actual uh, sequences, functional sequences, natural sequences, only very large phenotypes have been explored by natural selections. So you have here a whole ensemble of networks that are never visited, even if their fitness could be perhaps higher than, this, uh, than, than that of, of the sequences of the structures that are observed in nature, they are not seen in nature. So this is telling us that there are very strong entropic effects in natural selection. This is, um, we believe that this is the way to go if we want to quantify precisely how this degeneration, so this redundancy that networks have, uh, compares or competes with fitness uh, of, of a given sequence, of a given structure in function. Right, so there is always this. Uh, there has there has been this this discussion between uh, whether uh, neutral evolution is more or less important than adaptive evolution. So what what matters more more this uh, the generation, this entropy, 
or fitness or how good I, I, I function in a given environment. So, of course, there is something of both in... in, yeah, in yep. Um, so, so this... Um, is this, is this a, a selection or, or could it be um, um, probability of observing? So th this is a graph, the X axis is on the log number of sequences, right? right? And so um, as the, the number of sequences is decreasing because you don't have an exhaustive, uh, the ability to do an exhaustive uh, enumeration, um, right. they will become less and less likely to be for you to find even an instance of them from which you could build the uh, the um, the network uh, and and its its size, that could could that be also playing a role? Sort of some of the some of the clusters that are smaller will be you'll be unable to identify because you don't have an infinite number of real sequences. Yeah, uh, let me explain because I may have. Uh, I, I may have mixed it to two different uh, ways of estimating these distributions. So of course, if you have long sequences, now forget about this plot. Just imagine that we are doing computational analysis of our uh, space of sequences. And I just uh, generate sequences at random and calculate how many of them fold into a given secondary structure. What I'm going to observe is what you say precisely. I'm only going to see large clusters. So this uh, random selection, actually, so this uh, uh, most sequences, 99.99, many nines percent of sequences fall into a few uh, phenotypes, which are the large phenotypes. So this is what I'm going to observe. You're right. And this is why, so in, in, in so many years ago, people were trying to fit power laws to these distributions at the time of power loss, you remember. So, uh, because we were only seeing the tail of this distribution. But this is another thing. What I'm showing here is you go to the data bank and you have one single sequence that has been selected by nature, right? But there are ways of estimating how many other sequences would fold into the same secondary structure. And this is done for non-coding RNA, such that uh, so you, you don't have to go over different levels of expression and going to the protein. So it's just, it's just non-coding RNA where sequence is important. Single sequences. And then you estimate how many others that you don't see. You don't see in nature. You just see one fold into the same secondary structure. And this is what we are representing here. And this is all the universe of known, uh, sec so of known functional sequences of length 100. And further, by other methods, we estimate the associated size of the neutral network. So one is so the first case is sampling of random sequences. Yes, you are, you are only going to observe the tail, but this is what nature has selected for single sequences. So I know it's a little bit involved, but here you don't have these problems of, um, of selection of, of sequences that you have in the first approach. Right. So, I mean, everything that we observe in nature is related to very large uh, networks, right? So it's not that we observe of the network, we just see one sequence of the network, but we know that the, the network, of, so that the other possibilities are equally large, right? So this increases navigability, and then when you do phylogeny, you can move uh, and, and, and uh, so accumulate mutations, and you don't lose function in, in a very systematic way. And also, when you do some other estimations, for instance, of the number of outgoing links from a network of, of uh, whatever size, you see that if you just do uh, random walks in the space of sequences by random mutations, then there are so, so networks of, of typical size, so the maximum here, you are never going to stumble onto these networks in the age of the universe if you do a random search. Okay. So uh, large uh, genotype networks, what allow you also is a very high accessibility for other different phenotypes. For instance, uh, what I'm showing here, in, in, so uh, projecting into dimension, something that has a, has a very high dimensionality is different phenotypes, the, the genotype networks associated to each phenotype. And so schematically, there is a boundary to these uh, networks and some contacts between different phenotypes, such that uh, just they are one mutation away. 
So, uh, so if you are sitting here in the yellow network, just in one mutation, you can go to the green network. If you are sitting somewhere else, well, not in the yellow network, but in the green network, you can jump to the red network uh, in just one step, depending on the place where you sit. And for large uh, phenotypes, which are the common ones, the ones that nature has found, there are many places of contact um, if you just navigate those networks by random drift. Right. So uh, when we imagine how is the contact between different phenotypes in our spaces, this is the picture that emerges. This is again the space of sequences of length uh, 20, and these are the different phenotypes that you have. And you see that most of them are directly connected. So there is uh, there are points in these neutral networks corresponding to each phenotype that allow you to jump in one single mutation to any other phenotype in your space. Right? So you see, this is a very intricate picture, but this is how we really have to think about um, molecular evolution based on this fine tuning of, of single mutations, okay? So um, also I, I didn't mention here that the process is not symmetric in the sense that for instance, the green network has some points of contact with the yellow network and uh, the, the, the uh, relative probability that being in one network you jump uh, to another one is not the same if you reverse the process. For instance, there is just one possibility to jump to this blue network if you are in the green network, but maybe uh, it's not the other way around if this uh, network is very small, for instance, right? So uh, this means that if you go from one phenotype to another, you are moving here inside, you have your neutral mutations, and then you uh, experience some mutations that changes your phenotype. The likelihood that you reverse the process is not the same, it's not symmetrical. So for instance, this very large phenotype is highly trapping, you have uh, many possibilities to enter this phenotype, but once you are here, maybe you wander uh, in, in, through different genotypes and you never find the door or the, or the, the contact again with this blue small phenotype, right? So there is a direction also when, um, when you visualize your space of genotypes in this way by partitioning into different networks. Also, uh, phenotypes have meaning have fitness in a given environment. So fitness is an environment dependent quantity. Also thinking again about this RNA, you may have just imagine two environments where temperature is different in environment E2 versus environment E1. When you fold your sequences, the same sequence can fold into different phenotypes if you are in different um, environments. And also the value of this uh, phenotype might be different. So it's, better to imagine to picture this uh, microscopic evolution, this sequence evolution as uh, an adaptive multiscape. This is what we introduced it some time ago, uh, where you have your phenotypes with, with a complex structure within each phenotype. You have these possible jumps between phenotypes. And then if you change your environment, you have the same sequence maybe, but a different phenotype and a different fitness. And then so this process would take uh, place that the optimization, if any, or neutral evolution would take place in, in another environment. So uh, this is a, just a rapid summary of the structure of these networks. And now let me say a few words about the dynamics. I have skipped all the math, but uh, there is a, also a review we wrote recently with uh, what we know about the dynamics on such networks. And I'm going to explain some of the phenomenology of uh, sequence evolution on networks with the topology that I have just described. So when you have evolving populations and you have this picture, this map that is induced by this genotype phenotype mapping, you can have first evolution on a neutral network. So depending on these uh, properties of the neutral network, degrees, uh, ongoing, uh, ingoing, outgoing degrees, and so on, you can will have certain dynamics within this neutral network. Then you might have adaptive evolution where you change phenotypes. So you have a mutation that moves you to a different phenotype and your adaptation in a given environment changes. And finally, you can respond to environmental changes. I'm not going to delve much into this uh, last point. 
but this is something that I think it's worth uh, keeping in mind when we uh, when we follow when we try to interpret also experiments on 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 uh, evolution and adaptation. Okay. If you jump to another environment, uh, and, and uh, by jumping, I mean that you have your population with your sequences, but you, if you change the environmental conditions, you change the adaptation, the degree of adaptation of your population of your sequences to a different phenotype, different conditions, and then the process of adaptation can repeat in this other environment. Right. There are uh, so so many observations that seemed uh, weird in in old times and uh, to which many papers have been devoted, like like uh, Waddington uh, processes and so on, that are easily very easily understood if you have this picture of networks uh, in mind. So this is discussed also in some of the papers that we have published in the last uh, five years or so. So one, one first property of, of these dynamics is that uh, phenotypic entrapment occurs. Since uh, your uh, networks are assortative, so first you have a trend towards more connected regions of the neutral network. This is a natural trend and uh, this can be demonstrated This is an, an easy calculation to show that. So robustness to mutation increases along neutral evolution and populations tend to uh, say, uh, protect, but in a, in a, in an unsupervised way uh, from, from the effect of, of uh, mutations that would change the phenotype. Can I ask another clarifying question? Yeah. Uh, so I, I think I, I got a little bit lost a, a second ago. So um, the size of the circles here are not related to the size of the neutral networks, right? They are ah, related yeah. to the population. Right, you're right. Yeah. That's my mistake. I should clarify that in, in future talks because I'm um, yeah going uh, going through an overview. Yes, this is the population. So right. now I'm, now, I'm, now I'm, it all I'm, makes sense. Right? Yeah, so, because so, because so this you, is neutral. This is neutral evolution. Exactly. This is okay. yeah. So what? You, <laughs> okay, you sorry about that. You're worrying about you you each each one of the circles represents a neutral network, and now you are saying if I have ah, uh, yeah. A, You're right. A large population. Oh, no, 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 no. It's just uh, you might have have said it. I don't even sure. Sometimes. Oh no, 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 no. I didn't. And you're, you're absolutely and I was, right. Yeah. I, I just wanted to be sure that I was um, figuring out, what, mm. kind of following the entire argument. And and that, now that I I know what it is, it 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 makes perfect sense. And I I, I got it. Thank you. Yeah. So you're right. So each node is now a sequence. So, uh, yeah, uh, so the populations understood as the number of sequences that uh, occupy each of the nodes of, of my network of genotypes now through neutral evolution now go to more connected regions. And since those networks are assortative, and this is something that we learned uh, after, so Huin and et al. published this paper, for instance, then uh, we know that uh, there is a sort of entrapment. The, increases the average degree more and more every time and has a, a delaying effect um, that uh, ex uh, so it is translated into an acceleration of the ticking rate of the molecular clock. So it's easier and easier the longer you've been sitting on a phenotype to accumulate new mutations. So the clock is somehow a relativistic clock that accelerates the longer uh, the time you've, you have spent in this phenotype, right? Um, another consequence uh, of the architecture of neutral networks is that you have punctuated dynamics. Why? Because they have a community structure. So um, there are groups of uh, nodes of sequences that are more tightly connected uh, within this group than two other groups in the same neutral network. So there are sort of bottlenecks in your dynamics. You might spend a long time within a community. And then if you find the, 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 the connection to another community that is more connected, then you, you can jump to this other community. And this is produced in, um, in a punctuated way. So this is an example uh, from uh, another. So Klaus Wilke uh, did this with another model, but uh, the, the the principle is the same. So you have these increases, these discrete increases in um, 
in, in the connectivity, therefore in your fitness somehow, because uh, the, in practice what happens is that the effect of the deleterious mutation decreases as you spend more time in those phenotypes and you get more and more trapped into uh, the, the into these communities of, of uh, higher connectivity, right? So you see here, uh, just the very structure of the genotype networks leads to punctuated dynamics. So evolution, even at the microscopic level, at the lower, possibly at the lowest level, is not something that is gradual. It is punctuated. The same happens if you think of adaptive evolution. Now, this is another case in which uh, instead of moving within a neutral network, you're adapting, so changing your phenotype. Uh, here, the example is I have a goal secondary structure and I start with a random popula a population of random sequences and I select my sequences as a function of, the, of how close the, the, their corresponding minimum energy secondary structures are to the goal structure that I have. So what I see here is that, and this is a representation of the spread of my population of sequences in the space of sequences, I see that I have adaptive bottlenecks. So a few uh, um, sequences are selected. I have a spread of my population. This is clearer, for instance, here, where you see a few sequences jump to this new, so represent this new structure. You have the spread in the space of sequences and then subsequent jumps again uh, through adaptation. So in neutral evolution, you have punctuated dynamics. In adaptive evolution, you do have punctuated dynamics as well. It's nice that uh, we have some empirical examples of, of this kind of behavior. This is a, a nice uh, case example uh, that was developed at the group of Mercedes Pascual. And this is how the sequences of influenza A drift and shift uh, from one phenotype to another through the seasons, just to avoid uh, to escape the effect of the of, of immune individuals. So what they observed was that uh, you have a viral population that is sitting in a neutral network and this corresponds to a, to a certain uh, dominating strain in a given uh, flu season, All right? So through time, th there is a spread of this population in this neutral network. And when the number of um, individuals that are immune to this strain has increased enough, then there is a strong select pressure to jump to a different antigenic uh, solution for the virus. And this could be seen in the sequences. You jump to, to this uh, other network represented here in orange through a, what is called a selective sweep. You have a bottleneck in diversity. You decrease your diversity. And then in the next season, you again spread in your network and the process repeats. So there is this epochal evolution and uh, innovation in the sense of finding uh, new uh, antigenic uh, types that uh, again, cause these seasonal waves of, of flu, right? So, uh, and this is a mixture of, of the processes we've been talking about um, from a theoretical viewpoint. There is something else when, uh, when we are subject to more than one selective pressure. This is also a case example that we worked uh, in. So at, at the very beginning, when we started to be interested in these networks, and uh, this had to do where, with where is my population sitting if I'm only selecting for robustness, so if I'm, work, I'm, I'm evolving in a neutral network, or if I have a second uh, phenotype uh, feature, for instance, a low energy of my fault, and somehow I tune the strength, the relative strength of one selective pressure versus the other, right? Uh, so we could work with a parameter that uh, gives uh, more importance to high robustness or more importance to low energy. And the question was, what happens in between? How does my population go from one situation to another if my environment is changing slowly? That was the key point. What's the response of my populations of the microscopic level if I'm uh, subjected to environments that change slowly? And this is the result. So for a very long time, this is the parameter we were tuning. So separating this uh, relevance of robustness versus relevance of low energy. And you see that my population tends to sit on one of the uh, limit uh, configurations until a sudden transition occurs. And then it moves very rapidly to the other side. So we do not know whether this uh, transition is continuous or discontinuous because there are severe uh, 
finite size effects and uh, we, we cannot reach uh, large sizes and, and we do not know yet the theory for this transition, but you can see that the effect is dramatical. So your population is maximally dispersed uh, at the transition point and the time to reach mutation selection equilibrium decreases enormously, in increases enormously, right? So um, one of our questions was, yep. Wait, sorry, is there any hysteresis depending on which, from which direction you are going on, on this page? Sorry, uh, what I'm showing here is mutation selection equilibrium. So this is not hysteresis, but if we allow for a finite time in the transition, so we have, which would be the real case, you just have an environment that is changing at a given rate, and then your population probably doesn't uh, have enough time to adapt, and this is particularly true when you are close to the transition, then you do have hysteresis. Actually, we have, I have some results that I, we have not included, I have not included in the talk, but uh, I can show you some plots of how this occurs. You have uh, severe fluctuations, you have all sorts of these uh, early warning signals related to this kind of transition, and you do have hysteresis also, yeah. Okay, so um, this is another example where um, what we did was to, to work with somehow more realistic uh, landscapes. Uh, and we implemented here uh, NK Kaufman models, doesn't matter. It means that for each node, for each sequence, you have a, a correlated landscape uh, where you assign a fitness to each of these sequences, right? And then you do the same evolutionary dynamics. You have replication of your sequences, mutations to neighbors, and so on. Here in the colored pictures, what you see is all the nodes in the network, all the sequences, and the population in each of those uh, sequences, no? the abundance of, of each of the sequences in my population. And here you see the changes in the environment. So there was some little noise and some small trend smooth trend from one landscape to another. You see that the landscape changes smoothly. So if you plot just with, uh, again, the size of the circles, the fitness of each uh, of, the, of the sequences in your um, population, uh, you don't appreciate any changes here. But if you look at where the population is sitting, you see sudden transitions that move the population from one region to a very different region. Okay, so this was a proof of concept and we were always uh, wondering whether we could see these transitions somehow in real systems. Um, so up to now, uh, we haven't found any data because uh, for that we need adaptation to different environments and this is not sort of experiments that, uh, I mean, uh, yeah, people do just to check uh, theoretical predictions or for basic science, because they are, these are quite expensive experiments. But uh, for, for also for a long time, we've been collaborating with an experimental group, uh, and they work with the Q-beta phage, which is uh, this little phage here. It infects E. coli and has a very small genome uh, formed by just four proteins. Uh, two of them overlap. So it's a very simple virus, right? And, uh, it's an RNA virus. It uh, therefore forms highly heterogeneous populations and you can see evolution in real time, essentially. So uh, what they could do was to start with an ancestral population and passage uh, this ancestral population under different environmental conditions that we designed it, we designed it together actually these experiments until you finish with an evolved population. So this is just a summary of the different situations they have uh, implemented in the laboratory. So you, here you have your ancestral population, which starts at, uh, adapted at 37 degrees. And then you expose these populations to different temperatures. And I, here I, I will only uh, uh, pay attention to the cases where the population uh, goes to a different temperature immediately. So at, at passage one, and this temperature is kept and we follow the evolution of this population a long time at 43 degrees, 40 degrees, 37 degrees, 33 degrees, and 30 degrees. There are other patterns of change that uh, I, I'm not, I will not be interested in in this talk, okay? So I have these five evolutionary lines. And so symbols indicate points where we have deep sequenced different regions of the, uh, of the virus. 
we have uh, selected three regions one here at the beginning in the first protein, a second one here overlapping these two proteins and also with a small non-coding region in between, and this third region which is in the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. And, and this is interesting also because uh, the, 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 the structure, the 3D structure of this protein is known, so we can also uh, study the effects of the mutations we observe. So we have taken these three regions and we have, as I was saying, deep sequenced the populations in, in different conditions at different times of adaptation and uh, in different environments. And this is what we have now. So for each of the regions, what I'm showing here is the number of different nodes. This means different sequences, different genotypes, short, admittedly short, because these are sequences of length uh, from 250 to 330 or so, uh, that have been visited by the virus. So all these different genotypes we have observed in real populations of the virus. This is the number of edges and the same for the other two regions. What we have done here is to reconstruct the full network of genotypes that have been visited. I do not mean that they are necessarily, um, uh, say, functional, because I might have mutations that are just uh, produced because there is a very abundant neighbor that uh, populates that, that region, right? But, uh, well, anyway, this, this, this has been visited, right? I, I mean, it's absolutely impossible to think that we will be able of uh, exhaustively exploring uh, the uh, space of length at 250. That's absolutely out of reach. But this gives us an idea. And uh, our, our aim now is to, to understand whether the topological properties of these networks, which are already fairly large, half a million nodes is already a large net network to, to evaluate the, the topological properties, whether this has similarities or not with what we have observed in or, or what we expect from theory, right? So this is what we did. We took our uh, genotypes, reconstructed the network. And again, if two genotypes are at a distance one, we have a link between these two nodes. Um, this corresponds to all the experimental conditions that we have for each of the regions. So we don't care at this stage whether uh, the genotypes have been observed at, the, at one temperature or another. This is just part of, of the universe of accessible genotypes to this virus. And uh, what I can show you here is just preliminary results because this is what we are working in currently. Where, um, so in this example, I represent the top 10 most abundant sequences um, for the uh, reconstructed networks in black in the background. And then the dots represent uh, the observations. And you see how the population moves in this space, right? So at 30 degrees, it prefers to be sitting here, and I go to uh, uh, an environment where evolution has, uh, has uh, proceeded at 43 degrees, and you see how this population moves. Of course, we have just five points at this moment, so we do not know whether there are severe transitions in between. Actually, we do not know whether this is close or far from the mutation selection equilibrium, even if it has been passaged for 60 passages. And, and if you talk to experimentalists, that's, that's uh, incredibly much when you do these adaptation experiments. But this is where we are. So I'll show you also some networks with the top 100 of the most abundant uh, genotypes. And here you clearly see this movement from one region to another region of, of genotype spaces. So this is our first, uh, our initial results into probing how um, uh, these evolutionary dynamics in, in heterogeneous population work. We have many open uh, projects related to understanding how is this movement from trying to infer the fitness of um, of each sequence by using a combination of topology of sequen and sequence abundance to, of course, uh, trying to see whether there, there are any sudden transitions or if we can estimate the fitness of genotypes that are not seen, but that might be, maybe should be there, right? So this is what I wanted to share with you. There are many other things that uh, we can discuss now in the questions and answer time. Uh, but uh, a few take-home messages. Uh, so the space of genotypes is better visualized as a multi-layered network of networks, and this structure uh, gives it has a severe relevance in how uh, evolutionary dynamics proceed at the microscopic level. 
So uh, there is a similarity between uh, adaptation in neutral networks, adaptation, actual adaptation uh, to new phenotypes or responses to changing environments in this punctuated equilibrium at the microscopic level. I was saying, yeah, there is some theory that I didn't talk about, but there is sort of competition between networks that describes this behavior. And uh, yeah, our, our topic now is to see if uh, we can uh, relate the theoretical properties that we have been uh, studying for the gate to empirical properties of, of genotype networks. Another message, very important one. This is not a good representation of sequence evolution. I mean, this should be banned, absolutely, because if uh, you, I mean, in my experience, and, and uh, I'm talking about 20 years of talking to experimentalists, they come, they have this picture in mind, and they interpret their experiments, their results in the light of these smooth landscapes. And I mean, if you change your uh, metaphor and then think of networks, then all of a sudden things that don't, do not make sense do have sense and it, uh, they are much easier to interpret. So just, yeah. This is uh, please <laughs> so change the, the, the vision, the metaphor you that, that, that you have for, for evolution, right? So these are some of the people, well, some of the people, most of the people that have accompanied me in this uh, trip. Esther was in charge of the experiments. She has a, a laboratory at the Center for Astrobiology was, where I was uh, also working for uh, about 14 years. And uh, Jose is uh, also a close collaborator. He knows lots of math and can do these complex combinatory calculations with different structures and mapping into sequences and so on. So some of these people were in my group at different stages now are in different uh, places also and okay we have had collaborations all over the world if uh, you are interested in the topic we have written uh, an extensive review that is now under uh, revision in physics of life reviews with 17 other authors <laughs> so that it's a hundred pages review so you have to be very enthusiastic about the topic to go through it <laughs> but <laughs> this can give you a nice perspective of the state of the art and and where are we heading to in this uh in these studies of evolutionary mean dynamics so and that was all thank you very much thank you really really great talk fascinating and um, i I know that I asked you if I could if I could interrupt you in the middle of the talk. Maybe I Absolutely. should have prepared you that I was probably going to be the person to interrupt with questions because I always do that. Um, okay, so um, we have a question here. Um, I, I can read it, or or can you read it too, or should I? Uh, yeah, I have uh, two questions here. Uh, just one, actually. One is yeah. a reminder, and the other is uh, you said that you connected nodes if they had differed by one, which I, I understand would be a point mutation. How does larger deletions, insertions, or other changes affect the landscape and results? Ah, yeah, that's the question. Absolutely, because what we have doing at some point, I feel that we have been just uh, so grasping the, the very simple minimal landscape of, of how evolution proceeds. I mean, this has nothing to do with, uh, with a real actual evolution, even in viruses. So this is just the fine tuning of evolution. So once you have a gene and then you have a small change in the environment and you have to keep your function, then you have these point mutations. I mean, even deletions or uh, insertions change the dimension of your space. And this, this is already something that is difficult to imagine. For instance, something that we are doing now also with those uh, empirical data is to try to renormalize uh, from longer to smaller sequences. So what happens if I project what I have for sequences of length 250 into sequences of length 100 and, and lower? So, and, and see if there are any properties that are maintained because this is essential to understand whether there are alternative pathways in higher dimensions that you do not see. So, um, and, and yeah, this is, this is even at, at this level, right? But I'm well aware, and this is also one of my interests, that the actual evolution does not proceed by uh, point mutations, right? So you have horizontal gene transfer and uh, combinatorics of functions and so on. For instance, for viruses, this is essential. So there is all this revolution in, in picturing uh, viral genotypes as networks of sharing genes. And this is much more accurate than phylogeny, absolutely. So phylogeny is just a little bit 
of, of, of what uh, actually happens. So another of my interests, for instance, are multipartite viruses. And uh, multipartite viruses have their genomes divided into different capsids, and they have to co-infect cells if they are to complete the viral cycle. And our hypothesis is that this is just uh, an opportunistic, um, say, association, transient association mm -hmm. between different genes that gives you a different etiology of disease. And, and, and different uh, functions at the higher level. And, and this is uh, very good for adaptation because you don't need to be in the same chromosome to, to be functional. And uh, yeah, that's, that's much hotter, I guess. So I've spent lots of time with these genotype networks, but I'm fascinated about, uh, so the other levels. Yeah, so yeah, I cannot answer that <laughs> in the sense that I cannot include this in this simple picture. You should use different approaches. I have another question, and, and it's it's kind of changing the the mode a little bit. Um, so we here at NICO try to uh, promote collaboration between people from different backgrounds and, and kind of what I like to call true collaboration as opposed to sort of parallel play, which I think sometimes goes on, which is you, you do something and pass it to me or something and then I do my thing and we really don't talk very much. So I, I, was, I was really, you know, maybe other people didn't notice, but when you said that you were working with experimentalists and the two of, and, and you together decided how to set up the experiments and stuff, that is exciting to me, right? Because that's the right thing when you are not saying, oh, I do my business, you do your business, and then in the end, we'll see if it connects or not, as opposed to let's make this something in which we are contributing together. Do, do you want, would you be able to share a little bit more about that process? Because I think it's, it's useful for other people to realize yeah. how to accomplish that, because sometimes people are afraid of not being able to do it. So Absolutely. You know, yeah, yeah, that, that's an amazing. So intellectually, that's amazing. That's, that's, that's really rich and that's challenging, but it's also very difficult because somehow you're stepping into other uh, communities, into other uh, so approaches. And uh, first of all, you need to develop a common uh, vocabulary, a common dictionary. And that's not so simple when I say model. I mean, um, so my variable goes those like that or like those when something happens in my computer, they understand Scherichia coli or some other people understand uh, a Gaussian distribution. So model is also already something that has many exceptions and you have to agree on, on, on how you talk to other people. So my recommendation is if you wish to collaborate with someone, just lots of coffee, lots of beer to begin with, to spend <laughs> lots of time to this person. So not only read the papers, but sit, sit with this person and, and get to find common interests. Because this is one of the, of the, of the questions that I find, find more important. It's not that I, I can do some math or I can do some models and you do your experiments. It's that we should be interested in the same scientific questions. And this is how we can progress in that. Right? Sometimes some people approach you and they say, well, but you should have a formula to solve that. No, I mean, maybe I could have a formula, but I'm not interested in your problem. So, <laughs> so that's, that's one point, no? And developing this common uh, knowledge. And then uh, I think that the, a sincere interest for the other field is also required. You will never be an expert in, the, in, in, in laboratory techniques, but I should know how they work. I can tell you an anecdote in this respect, if I may just interrupt me whenever you think I'm talking too much. No. But some time ago, we were uh, working with, uh, so they had some weird experiments where they had measured uh, a long time, the RNA amount of a certain virus and the number of infective particles of that virus. And they, they were showing me a timeline, so a time series, presumably, of what was happening, right? So I was looking at the fluctuations of this time series and I was saying, oh my God, I mean, but that's impossible because they're working with 10 to the six, 10 to the seven particles. And they have these fluctuations where they move the value by two orders of magnitude, right? Something like that. So why is the law of large numbers here? And we were arguing with Esther actually for about eight months. And this almost ended our friendship. <laughs> because <laughs> <laughs> because it was like, no, it cannot be. And she was claiming that I was not including enough details in the model. Right? So how can you 
so transmit to someone the details are not important when you look at certain things yeah. and the other person sees that you are not advancing and you are not taking into account the details that they consider to be so important, right? So this was a very long time until one day, the person who has carried out the experiments came to me and said, no, because when we do these experiments with different plates and I say, wait a second, how do you do the experiments? <laughs> so what they did, they had replicates of each of the plates and then they were stopping them at different times. So of course you have this memory of, the, of what has happened at the beginning yeah. in each of the conditions. And yeah. what was shown as a time series was not a time series, was different samples, yeah. right? So, I mean, this is an example. This finished in, 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 ended in PNAS again, but it was really something very tough. So if you do not know a little a bit uh, about the experiments, about the protocols and, and the other way around, you can get into cool de sac uh, very easily and, and not really do the, the actual collaboration we are aiming for. Yeah. Thank you. That that was a really wonderful story. And 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 it's kind of, I think all the people that have tried these kind of things have have experienced that. And, and it's one of the risks, right? And you have to be willing to be, in a sense, brave uh, and, and put yourself through it to but then it's when the real advance comes. Yeah. So oh, I think that there is another question. And I don't okay. want to impose on you, but if you'd be willing to stay a couple more minutes and answer that question, I think we would all appreciate it. Absolutely. Uh, um, in the punctuated dynamics, how similar would the paths be across replicates? For example, in the punctuated dynamics adaptation, there is expansion followed by the shrinking. When repeated multiple times, how similar are the populations during the shrinking? They are just qualitatively similar. So you have the same overall behavior, but of course, since um, the precise mutation that allows you to jump to another network is, uh, is absolutely contingent, so it's, it's, it's random, then uh, this can happen at any time and um, at, at different points, right? So if you cannot average, for instance, this behavior, you have to look at different realizations because the, the transition is going to happen at different moments. So the same question might ap uh, apply to a pandemic. So when is the next pandemic going to happen? I don't know, but there is going to be one, right? <laughs> because at some point that we will have these zoonoses jumping from one species to another. So let's all thank Susanna for a really, really stimulating talk and discussion and for sharing her experiences. Um, I think this is the kind of thing that we want to do at NICO and, and people being able to, to share the difficulties, but also the joys of, of doing this kind of work is really, really important. So um, let's all thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's been a really pleasure. appreciate you uh, coming and sharing your work and experiences with us. Okay, hoping for a future um, in person. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> we would love to have you in person here. <laughs> okay, so thank you and take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Have a good day. Bye. Bye, Megan. Bye, everyone.